I am very excited to be here with Hugh Cornwell. Hugh, thank you so much for your time. No and uh, we are here at the world famous Whiskey A Go Go, and tonight you're going right. to be performing. Have you played at the Whiskey before? I haven't. I haven't. In fact, I got to admit it's the first time I've ever been here. Wow. Well, so I've, I've got, you know, I've been in a lot, lot, LA lots of times. Mm -hmm. And I've always gone past it, and it's it's got a sort of a certain thing about it, and uh, I felt a little bit um, unworthy, you know, yes. like you know, you can feel like that, Absolutely. how crazy it is. So, um, but so it's nice to be officially invited in, okay. Okay. rather than just come as part of the audience. Very cool, very cool. Well, it is in fact world famous, and this is actually one of the most interesting green rooms. We've done a lot of interviews with folks through the years, and. Um, this is a really nice one. They've hooked us up really well here tonight. So I like it. Yeah, it looks it looks fantastic. Yeah. Very very happy. Very cool. Well, Hugh, one of the things that um, is a big uh, part of tonight's performance is talking about the most recent album that you've released, Totem and Taboo. I wanted to talk about that album. It had its roots in kind of a crowdsourced venture, whereby fans initially uh, funded the. Uh, production costs to get it out there. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, yeah, I mean, th th these days it's becoming increasingly hard, not just for artists, but f but going back one step further, uh, for record companies mm -hmm. to survive. So uh, the idea of, of finding a s uh, sourcing funding from a record company to make a record, for me, is, is, is a bit of a fantasy, you know. I mean, it would be a dream come true. <laughs> so uh, we, uh, rather than do that, um, uh, that, that fantasy came tr true for the album before Hoover Dam, but then that company uh, ceased to exist. So, um, so we had to find some other way of making a record. And the 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 the, um, the, the sourcing, the crowdfunding uh, concept had already started, um, but it's not. It was nowhere near as developed as it is as it is now. It's really yeah. sophisticated now. So it just made sense to go that way. And. Um, and I was very, very pleased with the results. Um, and the great thing about it is that I became aware and met and got to know people that, that were big followers of mine that I never knew existed. And some of them have become good friends, you know, and it's very satisfying to do that. And uh, if I hadn't have done the, the, this, this method of making the record, sourcing the funds through that, I would never have met these people. Wow. Yeah, we've talked to a lot of artists who've talked about in the 21st century, the whole distribution, mode of distribution, so different. And for some artists, it's, it's um, kind of scary to not have the backing of a record label. But for others, it's really uh, very uh, liberating yeah. to not have the pressures of perhaps um, creative stifling that sometimes happens with a record deal. Um, so for you, has it been liberating to not have too, a, as many constituents as you might otherwise have if you had a record deal? Absolutely. I mean, you can always have... Um in the past, it's all, it could always be involved. Uh, too many people involved, so too many opinions, mm -hmm. too many cooks in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. uh, this way, you get to make the record that you want, and um, uh, without anyone asking any questions, really. Uh, which, which is a, it's actually a, a position of responsibility. You've got to be responsible, you know. But um, but you can't really blame anybody else. You can't say, oh, this producer overproduced my album or whatever. But well, especially with Steve Albini involved, yeah. because he's not a producer, he will say, I am not a producer. I'm a facilitator. Okay. You tell me how you want it to sound, and I'll make it sound like that. <laughs> so uh, so so in particular with him. But yeah. the other th thing about this is that um, is that if a record company funds a record, they uh, legally um, own the, the, the record yeah. whereas if you crowd f f uh, source it yeah. um, you could people could say well well then don't the fans own the record well in a way they do but they get something they get a, it's a trade they, yeah. they put some money into the album and we give them something like yeah. access to the recordings yeah. um, backstage we you know they might come to concerts or get mm -hmm. some free tickets to go somewhere and see me or or things so, so it so they, they they end up not owning it but they got some special things and and the artist ends up owning their own record which is which is great you know that's that that's where it sh that's who should own it surely you know that's, that's totally how it should be yeah. definitely definitely and um well Hugh, you mentioned steve albini i wanted to mention him as well i mean one of the when you talk about uh wonderful epic albums the pixies Nirvana, I mean, um, one producer, and I'm going to use that name, even, uh, even though that may be offensive to him. One, okay, 
One facilitator that comes to mind, there we go, a little lesson I learned here from my friend Hugh today. <laughs> I'll, I'll say that in the future when we do interviews. Um, but he has had his um, fingerprints, shall we say, on so many wonderful albums. And so for you as just a, an artist who's definitely produced so much awesome content over the decades, uh, to finally get to, get to work with Steve, I mean, what was that like? I mean, what was, his, what was the process like? Well, it was fabulous. I mean, we really didn't think he was he was going to be interested or was going to be available. And we got in touch with him and he said, sure, I'll make a record with you. When and when do we start? You know, because Steve's known as being kind of selective. He doesn't jump at every little project. So it's kind of flattering to have Steve yeah, want to work with you. So uh, so then I tried to get him to come to work in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, but he's he was quite particular about what equipment he wanted to record it on. And I couldn't provide uh, a system that he was totally happy with. So I said, well, what, well, look, it seems like we should come to your backyard, you know, and do it, uh, do it at where you, where you record. Where, and which, so we went to um, his studio in Chicago, and, um, and uh, I'm really glad we did. Well, I think I'm also glad you did you as well, because I love the new album. I uh, was listening to it on the way here today, as well as recently a lot. And it's gotten really good reviews. Just the songwriting, the, 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 the catchiness of the tunes, the lyricism. I think it's a really great album. P folks have received it pretty well from your uh, perspective. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, when you're a songwriter and a recording songwriter, who are not just writing for other people when you're writing for yourself, you're in a constant process of getting some songs together and you go in and find a way to record them and then it comes out. And it's really, uh, it's, it's a lottery whether it's something's going to be applauded or not when it comes out. And you get used to that and so you don't really take any notice of whether people like something or they don't. So it's quite a surprise when you get good reviews. But, but, it, but it's totally... Uh, it's totally... Um, uh, it's not it's totally by chance that that happens mm -hmm. you know and it just happens to have happened this time yeah. i mean i i just set off starting to write a set of songs uh th that were like my heroes you know like I, i've got heroes so i wanted to write a, a song that was that was uh, that was like a, a song by Albert arthur lee and love i wanted to write a song that was like a doors song i wanted to write a song like this and that and the other and i ended up with this collection of songs which are my songs mm -hmm. Um, but that's how they, how it started, yeah. you know. Well, Totem and Taboo, I want to talk, of course, that was the name of a very famous Sigmund Freud book. And uh, uh, speaking of books and authorship, I want to talk to you a little bit about your own authorship. You are the author of a number of novels, one of which is, uh, was that a surprise to you? No. <laughs> I'm glad that you, I'm glad, I'm very happy to know that you're, you, you, you know about them. But. I'm very well aware, including your autobiography and some of the different things you've worked on. And we were talking earlier about crowdsourcing. My uh, my sources tell me that you're actually working on a book right now that you're seeking to get some support, some crowdsourced funding for. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, it's finished and it's already done. It's been published. It came out tail end of last year and it's called Arnold Drive. It was a sec my second novel. And yeah, we did that crowdsourcing through a company called Unbound, who are a crowdsourcing publisher. In my case, the book was actually finished, but they, they got hold of it, uh, these, this company, and they liked it so much that we know it's finished, but we like it and we want to publish it, if that's okay. So, uh, so I, I agreed to, to do that. So, so in a way, it wasn't really crowdfunded. Okay. <laughs> just there they pushed it right at they pushed it off the cliff a little bit yeah, there yeah, yeah, yeah exactly yeah that's a very nice i like that they pushed it off the cliff <laughs> no, no lemmings reference but it's all positive well um hugh speaking of novels that you've written uh, a multitude of sins your autobiography from 2004 talk to a lot of folks you know a lot of musicians out there have been doing autobiographies uh morrissey recently very successful johnny marr of the smiths uh, i actually was doing an interview with uh keith monkey warren of the addicts recently oh, wow. had him on a radio show that I have and uh, we were kind of joking but then he kind of revealed that he may be working on an autobiography and so uh, the fact that you've beat a lot of these guys to it by 11 years you can't beat this guy Hugh yeah, but <laughs> mine wasn't the first uh, was it the first? First, no, not by yeah. a long way, so, yeah. yeah. But, but speaking of that, I mean, for you to, as a musician, to open yourself up and to be kind of vulnerable, um, we also talked to Ben Watt a while back about a, a novel that he had written about his uh, family. And um, did you find that to be liberating, as, as we used that term earlier, or was it, was it kind of vulnerable to, to, to show a different side of yourself to fans that they may not have been aware of those facets of, of yourself? 
Well, I, I didn't come up with the idea of writing an autobiography. It was a, a publisher said, hey, you should do an autobiography. And I'd ne ne it had never crossed my mind. But I, but I have always fancied the idea of, of writing prose. So I thought it would be a good way to start to, uh, to write the autobiography. But I did, I did uh, the publishers who ended up publishing it, HarperCollins, I did say, look, I don't want a ghostwriter for this. You've got to let me write this myself, otherwise I, I, I'm not interested in, in doing it with you. And they said, fine, as long as you have an editor. And I said, that's fine. Yeah, you can have an editor. And we ended up getting on very well, the editor and I, so it was fine. Cool. How long did it take for you? I mean, did you do the stereotypical thing of behind a typewriter with some coffee and cigarettes, just banging, clanking at the keys? Or how long did it take for you to, to finish it? It was about a six-month uh, period, um, not all the time. Um, uh, and I used, there have been, uh, there's two books about the Stranglers. Um, uh, one I wrote called uh, The Stranglers Song by Song, which goes through all the catalogue of songs and an explanation of what was happening in the band when, when, when the song was written, as, as far as I could remember. So there's that. And there was another book called No Mercy, uh, which was an official Stranglers biography after I left. So, uh, so I had those two books handy because I, I had to have them handy because a lot of it, you know, when you go back over the years, it's hard to remember what happened when. But yeah. so I had those books on hand to, to refer to. You know, so I had help. Yeah, <laughs> some good source material there, of course. Six months, but it was it was cathartic. It was very liberating. I I sorted out a lot of things in my mind that uh, were unresolved that had been sitting there for a while, mm -hmm. and so it, it helped to tie a few ends. You know, loose ends. It was good. Well, speaking of the Stranglers, um, you know, of course, amazing band. Looking back on the early years, you know, in that band, uh, what are some memories that stand out? Collaborations, or other artists that you had the pleasure of taking the stand or being on stage with? Um, I know that the Stranglers, um, like some other bands that we've interviewed, the Addicts and other bands, um, didn't always fit into, the, at the time, the very almost restrictive punk rock silo that existed at that time. Um, you guys were definitely one of the more creative bands that wasn't necessarily, you know, doing things for trendy reasons or whatever. Um, and I don't really know what my question is, but I guess just looking <laughs> back, <laughs> we're just rambling. What but stands what, what stands out yeah. memory-wise, collaborations, uh, artists that you had the pleasure of, of working with or playing festivals with back then? Well, it was all, it was all fantastic. I mean, it was a, it was a remarkable ride and it, it was very fast and very furious and um, very dizzying and um, it was hard to to keep track of what was happening and uh, people you worked with and people you had the the the, the honor and the privilege to meet and to, to work with um, it's amazing it's like you've been opened up and you go into this room full of sweets you know and it's um and it's not just sexual sweets i'm talking about sweets in the sense wow you know, I met Bowie and I met, you know, all these people, I met Iggy and stuff and wow, wow. things like this. And the one thing I am sad about is that some people I would have liked to have met weren't around anymore. And I was due to meet up with Lou Reed because we had a, a common guitar tech. And I was in New York just as he was preparing for a tour and the guitar tech had put us together. And I was going down to meet him and we were going to hang out after his rehearsal. And then I got terrible flu and he got terrible flu exactly the same day and he cancelled his tour i had to go back to england so i missed out on that, wow. the opportunity and i was really disappointed at that because i would have liked that yeah rest in peace lou of course um well i mean did you have a chance to hang out with the whole kind of cbgb scene in new york i mean warhol any of those guys not quite no no i remember going to studio 54 once when the, everybody was there you know, lurking in the shadows yeah. and things. But it was all very da uh, daunting for me. I mean, it's when you come from the UK, and this was like early 80s, and you go to Studio 54, and there are all these people there that you recognize, and they're all like icons. You know, it's, it's I'm, I mean, I used to be I'm a bit more gregarious than I was then, but mm -hmm. it was all a bit intimidating yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in yes. a funny sort of way. Yes. Like, do I, am I, accept uh, am I exactly. acceptable to these? Do I, do I measure up? Just observing, you know. Uh, whereas now I tend to take part a bit more in things. Yeah, well, I think history has definitely proven, Hugh, that you have, are an active participant uh -huh. yeah, in yeah, the, the musical landscape. Yeah. Um, speaking of all the cool things going on with you, I mean, just such a diverse jack-of-all-trades as a musician, an author, etc. What can fans out there expect here for the near future from Hugh? Um, ah, well, I'm, um, I'm just finishing a, an album with John Cooper Clark singing. He has got a fabulous singing voice. You know John Cooper Clark, the English? I mean, he's a complete, unique English 
punk poet. There's nobody else like him in the world. And he's still out there being very creative. And I have the great fortune to, to know him quite well. And um, so I produced an album of him singing some old classic songs, uh, which is coming out later this year. We made a film for it. And, um, and uh, hopefully my first um, novel is going to be made into a movie. We're just, um, the script's finished. And... Uh, we're just looking at the funding for that. But that, you know, movies take years to make, you know. I mean, this probably won't get filmed for a couple of years. Wow. Um, so there's lots of nice things to look forward to, you know. Definitely, definitely. And one thing that I've heard is actually going to be kind of uh, debuted tonight is your most recent music video. For, for Totem and Taboo, I've directed a, a film for each of the, to go with each of the songs. And they're not literal, they're just a little film to go with each of the songs. And one of them, uh, for Bad Vibrations, we released a trailer on YouTube of the first minute of it. And to coincide with the beginning of the tour, we released the whole thing. So it's, it's on YouTube. Um, there's a lot of uh, animation of special effects in it. So, and we're quite pleased with it, sort of, sort of Alice in Wonderland type, uh, a scary Alice in Wonderland. Wow, okay, all right. Well, we are not going to go down the rabbit hole right now with you, but maybe at a later time we will. So, uh, Hugh, thank you so much for your time. Really wish you all the best. And uh, definitely, if you're a fan out there, stay in touch, because this man has got a lot of very cool projects coming at you very soon. Thanks so much. Thank you very much.